So how do we find out about these examples of joint procurement and examples of uh, innovation in procurement? Um, in 2020, within our iProcurement project, we conducted online survey among European public procurers. And the aim of the survey was to learn more uh, about uh, this joint cross-border public procurement. And uh, as uh, Philomena uh, mentioned, we are using this, this abbreviation uh, to help us to define this process. Um, so uh, we received quite, um, and we were, I think, quite successful. We, re uh, we received 41 responses from 14 countries, as you can see here. Um, the question is, what do we find out? Um, we find out that actually uh, there is a lack of experience, uh, but overall uh, we can say it's a positive attitude towards joint procurement. Um, around 75% of the respondents had positive attitude toward uh, joint cross-border public procurement. Um, from 41 responses, uh, only 25% had experienced it. Uh, and I think also David mentioned it that the this either on one side the PCP or PPI I are still quite rare. So um, you can see uh, this was proved by uh, the analysis of the survey. And uh, so from those 50 percent were interested or even planned to engage in joint cross-border public procurement. Um, from uh, those 41. Uh, responses we received, 10 uh, of those were examples uh, of uh, joint, uh, real examples of uh, joint procurement. And from these 10 examples, three were from the security and defense sector, uh, and the seven were from other, for example, health sector. Uh, why it is uh, important? Um, because uh, we believe that as uh, or when it comes to public procurement, the principles that uh, were used in uh, other uh, public procurement standards, uh, even though they're from different sector, not from the security or defense, uh, can be applied generally also to uh, our security sector procurements. So um, also what I would like to point out here uh, is that there is a difference um, between PCP and PPI. PCP, uh, as was several times mentioned, is a pre commercial procurement, and PPI is a procurement, public procurement of innovation. And from those 10 examples uh, we received, uh, five of them were examples of uh, PCP, uh, five uh, were examples of joint procurement. Uh, according to directive, either be PPI or normal procurement. So uh, the main, uh, I think, uh, or from the procurement side of view, uh, very important difference is that the PCP, pre-commercial procurement, is actually exempt from the application of the directive. Um, and thus, uh, usually it's also uh, exempt from the application of your national or local law on public procurement. On the other hand, PPI is a subject of EU directives and the national law implementing those. And uh, now we can come to a more uh, fun uh, side. Uh, what are the good practices uh, that were identified uh, within these uh, examples of joint procurement? Uh, so you can take these uh, good practices and these examples when you will try to do your oven, uh, oven tenders. Um, that will uh, either be PCP or or examples of a tenders of joint tenders of uh, joint procurement. Uh, first of all, uh, it's important to build motivated and available teams in early stages of the project. Um, for example, in this project PPI for uh, HPC, high high performance computing very interesting project and it is not from the security sector um, they decided uh, that even before the start of the project to establish two working groups one dealing with the technical issues and uh, one dealing with the legal issues um, of course uh, these groups have to communicate frequently with each other but if uh, you want to uh, go deeper in some legal problems that 
that there will be probably some legal problems when you will do the joint procurement, cross-border joint, joint public procurement. Um, it may be got, uh, good not to bother technical people with this uh, too much legal details, you know, but still they have to communicate with each other. Um, also very important finding is that the key stakeholders should be identified and support from the senior management should be ensured. Uh, why is this important? Because um, when you don't have experience with this kind of project, um, with this kind of cross-border cooperation between different institutions, uh, it's very probable that there will be some mistakes. And uh, But mistakes are overall good because you always learn from the mistakes. But for you, you need to have someone to turn uh, for the support. And also, it's important to to of course have a support of your of your let's say senior management, even even the politicians, because uh, the security sector is to some extent um, there are some uh, sensitive issues. You know, there are some issues with the uh, governments not to would like to share their let's say procurement plans and so on so you have to persuade uh the your senior management and politicians that these projects uh this this joint procurement and procurement of innovation uh it's important that it's very important to cooperate with each other um okay um very important also uh, finding and this one is from uh, example of uh, buying vaccines in Estonia. Um, they mentioned in their response that the procurement should be organized using project based management. What does it mean? Uh, that you should divide all actions into phases with deadlines in responsible persons and rules for information flow and decision making. This is also important because uh, I think it will be quite uh, common if we start to do more of these uh, joint cross-border public procurements uh, that in the beginning there will be people who are quite enthusiastic about it, but then in later phases and maybe later projects, uh, there will there is a possibility that uh, there will be uh, somebody else doing uh, this job and it's good for them to have, uh, let's say, the rules in a written form, how we should communicate with each other and how will be decision taken and so on. So I think this is a very good suggestion also. And it was mentioned already a couple of times today that and this was mentioned specifically when uh, we were talking about uh, when we are talking about the PCP and uh, that the functional specification should be preferred overall uh, over uh, technical specification because they focus on long term needs and as i mentioned this was mentioned when referring specifically to pcp uh, but uh, i believe it can be applied also to the public procurement tenders in case the contract in outer you wants to promote innovation on the other hand uh, it comes with some difficulties and these difficulties are connected with uh, evaluating the tenders because evaluate the functional specifications is always a little bit it, it's more difficult than when you evaluate just the technical specification when you just click yes or no and that's it um, if your procurement is going to include uh, more entities from uh, different states uh, then uh, also, good idea is to start with harmonizing procurement practices. For example, to harmonize procurement plans. Uh, this is important so you, for example, don't uh, mismatch uh, the tenders. Let's say uh, Slovakia would like to procure uh, ballistic vests uh, in uh, coming year, and uh, let's say Poland would also uh, like to uh, procure this uh, this ballistic vest so maybe there's a possibility to, to do it together um, but uh, if you mismatch in starting of tender or actually mismatch uh, uh, in informing each other about that you would like to do this then uh, this can uh, hinder actually the joint procurement so let's start with uh, harmonizing very important phase uh, of uh, tender and this is uh, and this uh, concerns also PCP, but also the tenders according to the directive, the PPI. 
the tender preparation phase is always the most important phase. Um, because the mistakes that you do in this tender preparation phase cannot be solved in uh, tender itself. Um, in a tender preparation phase, you can uh, and you should focus on in-depth need assessment and uh, do an open market consultation, similar that uh, already Maria Campa presented during the uh, project. And then uh, tender process um, in in this project that was led by the by the CERN in in Switzerland. Uh, they suggested that uh, you should nominate a lead procurer that already has a long-standing relationship with all members of the bias groups, and this was proved to be successful approach in a certain project. Uh, I would like to point out that, that uh, we find uh, Institute of a Preliminary Market Consultation or Open Market Consultation, as uh, David Rios mentioned it, a very uh, important instrument for promoting innovation uh, on uh, one hand, but also uh, when you are doing the um, prior art analyze. So when doing the PCP, uh, you need to find out if there are already existing solution on the market. So this is a great instrument uh, to do that. And once again, you can do it uh, in PCP projects, but also in the tenders according to the European directive. Um, how these uh, preliminary or market consultations can lo look like, they can have a physical uh, or online form uh, in this Corona time. Uh, we are doing it, uh, at least in Slovakia for now, as uh, online meetings. Uh, for uh, simple projects, uh, it can take a form of a questionnaire. Uh, but uh, maybe of uh, end users, um, also great way how you can involve the end users uh, with uh, and involve them in a procurement uh, and uh, allow them to have a little bit of fun is that they actually can uh, see the presentations of different solutions uh, of innovative solutions and they can be involved in testing of the samples allowing end users to verify the suitability of the proposed solutions uh, and there are uh, less conventional methods for example as competitions hackathons either markets i don't think we are the, there yet but uh, this is maybe the future a uh, very important thing uh, when uh, doing open market consultation or preliminary market consultation, and uh, this concern, um, I think PCP and also PPI, is that the process must comply with the principles of equal treatment, non-discrimination and transparency stated in the directive. Uh, pre preliminary market consultations, they have several benefits. For example, if you look at the technical aspects, uh, they can help you in reviewing uh, technical requirements for the solution you need. Uh, they can improve uh, definition and qualification of unclear uh, requirements. And uh, and this concerns very much uh, the examples of uh, joint cross-border public procurements. Uh, they can be helpful uh, in legal and procedure aspect because during these preliminary market consultations, you can talk with your suppliers, you can uh, explain them how the process will look like. Uh, and then you can uh, deal with the conflict of law during the procurement procedure. Uh, Mar Marianne will talk more about the conflict of law. Uh, you can uh, tackle the questions like subcontracting uh, sub and uh, uh, tenders can ask question to clarify the application form. And uh, here uh, I would like to mention that uh, examples presented right now, we collect them, collected them through the online survey. But parallel to the online survey, uh, our project is also focusing on analyzing uh, the legal side of uh, joint procurement, which is very important and very hard topic. And uh, we are lucky, very lucky to have uh, Marianne with us. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. 
So indeed, uh, there are a, a couple of things that I would like to to mention about the legal side of this uh, of potential uh, joint cross border procurement projects. And um, I was actually very glad when I listened to the previous presentations by by Filomena and Maria because their advice uh, was quite uh, in harmony with what I am going to say and what uh, the thoughts I've had about this. So that is good. At least we are all, all on the same page. Um, now, very shortly put, and, and not to bother you with the paragraphs and, and the articles and laws, my my. I would like to give three main pieces of advice concerning the, the legal aspects. And um, the, the first one would be that you should um, not take anything for granted. The second piece of advice I would like to say is that you should prepare for everything. And finally, the third advice, please engage your lawyers from the start. So what do I mean by this, uh, these uh, slogans? Um, concerning the, the, the part of not uh, presuming anything or for not taking anything for granted, the thing is that we all know, of course, that the uh, procurement law is directed by the EU law, and therefore it is very, very similar and to a large extent uniform in all the member states. However, uh, the laws are not 100% the same. So it can happen that some points or some topics that are particularly significant for you and, and you as an experienced practitioner know how to handle them or how you handle them in your home practice routinely, but that solution might not be applicable in a cross-border uh, joint procurement situation if it is conducted under uh, another law. Um, to bring you some uh, simple examples, for instance, we know that the grounds for excluding economic operators consists of mandatory grounds and voluntary. And the mandatory grounds like, uh, like money laundering and other terrible crimes are, of course, the same in every member state. However, the other part of exclusions, the, the voluntary exclusion grounds, can differ. So, for instance, in some member states, maybe exclusion for the reason of, um, let's say, professional misconduct is mandatory, while in other member states is not. So if it is very important for a contracting party to have excluded anyone who is, has professionally misconducted or who is under um, uh, insolvency proceedings, for instance, it is important that you talk it through with your partners and make sure that that same result will be achieved in the joint cross-border uh, situation. Another example uh, of different approaches uh, that are possible in member states. I could bring the example that has been on the table in uh, in recent years, actually, concerning the threat of unsafe technolo technological solutions from some third countries. So some member states I know have been very careful in this respect and uh, have made um, introduced measures or, or practices to make sure that every technological solution is safe for security purposes and that every economic operator who participates in, in procurements um, also is, is not a security threat. While other member states have not maybe introduced the same measures. So if this is an important aspect for you, and it can be, I think, in, in security procurement, then again, uh, trust your partners, talk it through, and make sure that your good solutions that normally work for you are employed uh, in the joint cross-border situation as well. Um, another example more uh, of a more wide scale uh, can actually concern the choice, uh, or not choice, or the, the application of the directive. Okay, can I have the, yes, thank you. Uh, so we know that in the security sector, some of the purchases have to be subject to the classical directive, while other purchases can be subject to the defense and security directive. And of course, again, to a large extent, the practice of member states is very similar. However, there are some borderline cases where some member state looks at the purchase one way and the others maybe the other way. Well, to give you an example, Ammunitions and arms are always subject to the Defence and Security Directive. 
but drones and anti-drone devices and some security uh, surveillance equipment can actually be subject to either, depending on the situation and maybe depending on the member states' practice. So this is another uh, point to, to certainly consider, to, to talk it through again and to have a common ground for, for successfully uh, building this joint procurement project. Um, furthermore, sp speaking of having a common ground, it is always very crucial to have a thorough, um, wide and uh, detailed, very well prepared collaboration agreement. Uh, the collaboration agreement or, or agreement on joint procurement, joint procurement uh, agreement can have different names. Um, it is the, the most crucial part of uh, pre preparing a joint procurement. It can be very tiresome, hard work. It can take more time preparing a joint uh, cross-border procurement than preparing a normal procurement, but it is critical and it is necessary. And um, as, as Joseph also mentioned, the, the survey of uh, the uh, practitioners who have had experience with the uh, uh, joint cross-border procurement uh, also advised that the, the agreements be put in writing in clear way. And, and this is exactly why a collaboration agreement is a vehicle for making sure that we will have, okay, not, I cannot say making sure we have no disputes, but a vehicle to reduce disputes and conflicts and surprises, because surprises in a procurement process are normally not a good thing, okay? So we have uh, prepared a list of uh, issues that a uh, collaboration agreement could um, ideally uh, contain. I will not be going through them one by one because it would take too much time and, uh, and you can have a look at the slides later. Uh, obviously, the, the contract should uh, include all the liabilities of the parties, the system of project management, um, how do you react to unforeseeable situations, how do you make decisions, um, how do you manage the contract performance phase, uh, what are the financial duties of parties towards each other. If I can have please the next slide. Uh, thank you. And uh, also the um, obligations of parties in case there are disputes. Okay, but uh, there is one issue that I have it on the next slide, um, and I would like to turn a bit more attention to, and that cons concerns the applicable law and the com competent jurisdiction. So the truth is that we know when we have collaborators from different countries, then of course there is the question what national law applies to the whole project or different parts of the whole project. And um, can I have again the next slide? And actually even the next one. Thank you. Uh, so the decision or the clauses in the collaboration agreement that concern the applicable national law do not concern only uh, the public procurement procedure but also the collaboration itself. What law applies to the collaboration agreement? Also the review of um, joint procurement procedure. In the case there are economic operators who are not happy with decisions made or actions made by the contracting authority, the lead buyer. Where is the review going to take place and according to what law? Okay, if there are disputes regarding the contract performance, what law is the contract, the public contract subject to, and where do these disputes take place? And of course, then the procurement procedure. So, so the reality is that even though when the directive was still in the legislative process, there were um, proposals made towards this choice of law issues but they did not find uh, up in the directive. So in the current form, as it is in the force, the directive actually only has, um, has a clause concerning uh, central procurement uh, uh, bodies who conduct joint procurement. So on the next slide, please. So 
in case a central purchasing body conducts a joint uh, public procurement, we know that the, the public procurement must be subject to the law of the member state where the central purchasing body is situated, which makes totally sense. However, if we don't have procurement by the central purchasing body, but just different contracting authorities who have agreed to join their forces, then it is a must that they agreed which law the procurement will take place under. Because otherwise, the directive does not have default rules. Should, should the parties forget or fail to agree on which laws they apply, it will be a little bit complicated. It, it's possible to reach a conclusion, of course, but it uh, takes um, some knowledge of international law, lots of interpretation, probably some disputes, and uh, it would not be a nice surprise to, to find out that we don't know what law we're applying. Um, yes, so... So that would be my suggestions. And the last one was, of course, the reason why I said, please engage your lawyers from the start in order to, to have to overcome these uh, things uh, later. And I will now go, give the floor back to Joseph. Thank you very much. And thank you for, uh, I think, very interesting and very important uh, findings uh, of our project. And they are going to be helpful if you are going to do joint procurement so be aware there is uh, something like a collaboration agreement and uh, of course uh, work with your friends uh, colleagues but uh, in the end uh, have the basic things uh, in written form and you can use our presentation and our graphs for that um, we uh, coming back to the to the examples um, and suggestions uh, when uh, doing the joint procurement um we find out also difficulties that had to be overcome when uh, doing these projects and uh, of course you are going to have a different language and culture uh, so in the beginning and once again it can be in a collaboration agreement a common language should be agreed upon in the beginning of the cooperation in most cases uh, i think it was uh, Eng english uh, as the first language uh, there are going to be different processes, different processes in different member states, uh, different processes in different institutions. So, uh, as I mentioned before, as a suggestion about good practice, uh, it's good uh, to uh, talk about these different processes and try to harmonize them. Uh, coordination uh, can sometimes uh, be complicated uh, among public procurers. Um, so I suggest, uh, and this was suggested also, and it's not only my suggestion, it's, uh, it was mentioned in one of our examples that uh, you should organize definitely in the beginning uh, frequent, uh, even weekly telcos, uh, if it is not possible to meet uh, personally. Uh, so communicate uh, in the beginning, uh, try to clarify, uh, clarify basic terminology that is uh, going to be there uh, in the project. Um, also, uh, the thing uh, which uh, seems to be difficult, and I talk about it when, when I ask the question uh, to, to Maria, um, you should agree on the assessment process and decisions because uh, the evaluation part of the tender can present difficulties uh as mentioned before especially in the case of prescribing the subject of the tender using functional specification uh, and that was uh, actually also uh, in the case of the fables project which is also not from the security sector uh, but a very interesting one uh, i think they're testing autonomous uh, buses so uh, they approach this issue uh, by setting up the external evaluation panel in addition to their technical evaluation committee so there was a technical evaluation committee coming from the consortium members uh, and then they had even the external evaluation panel uh, and the members were uh, technical experts from other institutions that were actually not part of a consortium. Uh, now you can ask the question if all these things are even worth it. Uh, we believe they are. Uh, we find out there are many benefits uh, of joint cross-border public procurement. Um, 
and these were chosen by respondents. Uh, there is economies of a scale. Uh, very important, I think, the possibility to negotiate better contract conditions. Uh, this come uh, in hand when you are from the, let's say, small country, small institution, and you don't have uh, that much negotiating power over, uh, let's say, bigger uh, suppliers. So this can uh, come in hand in this situation. Very important. And this is a connected issue. I believe that the joint cross-border public procurement is actually innovative way how to do procurement. And on the other hand, it can be uh, it can be a way how to promote innovation when doing uh, in the correct way. Uh, so it was mentioned that the promotion of innovation and research and development, uh, very important thing also. Uh, for me, one of the most important benefits is the collaboration, sharing knowledge and exchanging good practices, uh, which uh, in the end comes to professionalization of a public procurement and also standardization of a technical specification. Um, joint cross-border public procurement can be solution also to some problems specific to health sector, but uh, also uh, that are uh, similarly in a security sector. There is a um, high level of confidentiality in the health sector, and there are different kinds of agreements for confidentiality. Uh, and they are typical for here. And I think this can uh, be applied also to the security sector. Uh, but what they find out in example of joint procurement for vaccine in Estonia is that actually they uh, were buying vaccines, same vaccines uh, for higher price than uh, in Estonia than in Latvia. And by doing uh, this joint procurement, uh, it had effect of opening the market and enabling the prices. Um, the suggestion was to us to make some uh, tips in the end. Uh, our tip is uh, you have another graph here. Uh, this uh, is the graph of uh, steps that you should uh, be aware of when preparing uh, joint uh, procurement, either PCP or PPI. Uh, other tips uh, are mentioned all uh, around the presentation, so uh, you will have it and you can uh, come to it uh, later. Um, what are the next steps of our project? Uh, we would like to know uh, from you what are your experience with uh, joint procurement, but also procurement of innovation. So please share with us your experience. Um, in the presentation, you also have a link to the analysis of the survey where you can find uh, more information about the specific topics. Uh, there you can find also links to the materials of the European Commission or other institutions. And uh, also, I have a one proposal for you and one uh, I would like to ask for your help. Uh, within the IPERCUNET right now, we were able to identify the possible segments where we would like to uh, do or firstly analyze possibility of joint procurement. Let's say uh, the first uh, segment, there are eight, of, uh, seg there are eight, eight segments. The first uh, are ballistic vests. And we are conducting right now uh, another online survey. Uh, this survey is uh, and we would like to collect information about the products and suppliers that are able to deliver innovative products and innovative solutions, but already uh, cuts if, if it is product already on the market uh, in these segments. And we are going to analyze these segments and the markets in that segment. So please, uh, in the chat, I will share the link to the survey. Uh, I would like to ask all the end users if you have experience with the products and solutions uh, within these eight identified segments, please share uh, your experience with us or you can even share it uh, wider. You can share it to suppliers that you are aware of and that you know that have uh, innovative solutions. And uh, this is also uh, the way how we can help the SMEs in the uh, security sector. Thank you very much.